We're here because we don't buy into the bullshit of mainstream culture. We're tired of the mundane, passionless careers we've been shuffled into as a result of this orchestrated debt-based system of rule, and the stranglehold on education and entertainment by cold, soulless corporations. People, yes, we are frustrated. Yes, we are tired. And we reject the brave roof tranquilizers that are Monday Night Football and an ice-cold Budweiser. But we have to stop hiding. Stop hiding behind the headphones and the Cherry Popper 420 username. Let the world see that the resistance is strong and society is changing. There was a time to be anonymous, but that time has passed. And so the higher side chats would like to present conspiracies as the dawning of this new paradigm in the uniform of the revolution. Because bold fashion should mean more than some celebrity meat dresser frat boy in a silly pink polo. Conspiracies redefines bold fashion as having the balls to reject socially uncomfortable and unpopular truths from your radiant chest all fucking day. Conspiracies.net. Let them know that you know. Bold designs for troubled times. Hard truths. Soft talk. How's it going, Higher Side Chatters? You know the routine. Drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke. I'm Greg Carlwood, and for all the uncertainty I have about reality and consciousness, my core belief is that we'd gain much more knowledge of the world around us by examining the stranger aspects of life rather than dismissing them. Things like psychedelics, out-of-body experience, psychic ability, and the behavior of other animals. Unfortunately, most of today's highly respected academics and leading scientists operate in exactly the opposite manner, and it's very rare to find someone strong-willed enough to absorb the education, tools, and intellect of the traditional academic system, but remain free enough to openly explore the topics considered fringe or paranormal. And today's guest, Rupert Sheldrake, is just such a rarity. Rupert Sheldrake was a student of both Harvard and Cambridge with a Ph.D. in biochemistry and has authored numerous books and papers on a whole host of interesting topics. I couldn't be more honored that he's going to spend some time with an idiot like me. Rupert, welcome to the show, and thanks for being here. Pleased to be with you. Man, you have such an impressive body of work. There's so many subjects we could talk about. I know your book, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home, it's over a decade old at this point, but I've always been curious about animals and pets, and I've always wondered how different our minds and consciousness and emotions are from them. Would you mind telling people a little bit about the research for that book and the unexplained power of animals that you found? Sure. Um, incidentally, a new edition came out last year, so there was now a fully updated version of the book oh, available. Awesome. Um, well, in the book, I de- deal with three <clears throat> main areas of unexplained powers of animals. Firstly, telepathy. Secondly, the sense of direction, including homing pigeons and dogs and cats that find their way home over hundreds of miles. Mm-hmm. And thirdly, premonitions, the ability of many animals to... Um, apparently, to foresee uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, or other disasters. Um, all of these are areas that we uh, of research that haven't really been done much with animals and or with people. And they're all things that we share with animals. We, uh, many humans are telepathic too. People have a sense of direction, uh, but it's often not as good as that of animals. And animals are better at premonitions. So animals have abilities that we have too, but to often to a lesser degree. And when I was investigating these, I went about it in two or three ways. Firstly, I have a huge database of more than 5,000 case histories of stories um, from vets, animal trainers, horse riders, hunters, pet owners, and so on, uh, about animals, which is the natural history. And this falls into a whole range of categories. Um, Secondly, I do surveys to find out how common this behavior is. And third, experiments. And the ones I've mainly investigated experimentally have been the ability of animals to know when their owners are coming home. Uh, Many dogs and cats and some horses and parrots and some other animals too know when a member of the family is coming home, even if it's not a routine time, even if they're not in a familiar vehicle, and even if no one at home knows when they're coming 
they go, they get excited, or dogs go and wait by the door or window. Um, sometimes ten minutes, even half an hour before the person comes home. So in our experiments, we have people go at least five miles away. Um, they come home at randomly chosen times. We choose the time and let them know by cell phone. Um, they don't know in advance when they're going home. They travel in unfamiliar vehicles. The people at home don't know when they're coming. And we film the place that a dog waits the whole time the person's out. And that way we have a full record of their behavior. And we can tell that um, over and over again, they seem to know when the person's coming home long before the person arrives and in a way that can't be explained by sound or routine or people at home giving them clues, um, but which seems to depend on picking up the intention of the person to come home. In other words, it seems to be telepathic. Right. That's the most interesting part to me is that uh, in your studies, the, the animal would get excited when the person stands up at their desk at work uh, rather than, you know, uh, when they're coming up the driveway, because I definitely experienced that with our dog. If my if my girlfriend is parked a block away, walking towards the house, the dog definitely picks that up. And I've had uh, friends dismiss that as a keener sense of, of hearing. And I'm like, but you can't see through the door. You don't know who that is walking up. So it is a really interesting phenomenon. I definitely think I experience it with my pets, um, that they, are, they seem more in tune to certain things. Um, given some of those examples of the mental connection between pets and owners, do you think that it's something that could be strengthened or developed? Well, I think it's already very strong in some dogs and cats. Um, I don't know if anyone's actually tried to train it. Um, it seems to happen spontaneously in so many animals. I don't know how you'd train it. I suppose rewarding the dog for, for, um, for giving a warning of someone coming would be one way, but just paying attention is a kind of reward. Um, so I think many people are, as it were, unconsciously training them anyway by paying attention to them. Um, yeah. I, so I just don't know. Some are so good at it that you could hardly get get any better, really. Yeah, it seems like just a sixth sense. But mm. um, I always thought cats were particularly interesting animals, and I don't know if you've heard about the cat and that Rhode Island Hospital, but it seems to know when patients are going to die and it spends the night with them before they go. Apparently, it's pretty well documented in the hospital. Yes, that case is, has been well documented because you know, one of the doctors actually studied it and wrote it up in, in a paper in a, in a medical journal. Um, there are many other cases of cats that do that. I, in my book, I describe several of them. Um, they seem to know when people are going to die. And um, it's surprising in in this case that it's people they don't know very well. You know, they, they're strangers, really. Um, but many animals know when their owners are sick or, or um, have a problem, and, and they go and comfort them. And it's one of the reasons that people get so attached to their pets, because they really do seem to care about us. Um, and some dogs... Um, give warnings of epileptic seizures and they're very helpful to people with epilepsy because they give them warnings long before they can know themselves, long before any other sign is available that a seizure is going to come on and it enables them to be in a safe place when it happens. It's, it's a phenomenal thing. I tend to think that if an animals can do it, you know, people should be able to do it. I, do you think that this, these abilities give some type of uh, clues into what consciousness is, what the mind is? Do you think there's yes. a mechanism there? Well, I think they do. I think what they, um, what they show is that um, it telepathy normally occurs between people or animals that are closely bonded emotionally. And... Um, I think what they show is that the bonds, the social bonds we have with people or with animals um, are real bonds, they're real connections, and I think they're mediated through what I call morphic fields. Mm -hmm. um, they stretch when people go away, it, these bonds aren't broken, they stretch, and people remain connected at a distance. That's why animals and people can quite often tell when someone they know has had an accident or even has died um, or when they when they need them or when they're going to come home 
uh, because they're connected. And I think these social bonds that connect still at a distance are the medium for telepathic connection or communication. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. I hear um, some alternative speakers and thinkers and philosophers talking about consciousness existing outside of the body, and it wasn't really until I heard about your morphic field that it sort of uh, it, it painted a little bit easier picture for me to grasp. And I, I think it's a really interesting concept, and it definitely explains some of these stranger aspects that uh, the dogmatic scientists, the traditional scientists, tend to just ignore rather than explore, which is really a shame. Well, it certainly is. I, I, I think that the, um, the, the concept I'm keenest on is the extended mind, the mind extending through fields beyond the brain. We're used to the idea of fields inside magnets which stretch beyond the magnet or the field inside a cell phone that stretches beyond the cell phone. Um, I think fields uh, of, my, of the mind are in our brains and stretch beyond them. I think when we look at something, uh, the image we're seeing is projected out by the eyes to where it seems to be, and our minds connect with what we're looking at. And that is the basis of what I call the sense of being stared at. Um, incidentally, my book called that, The Sense of Being Stared At, is coming out in the new edition in a, in a couple of weeks. So the extended mind is, I think, better than the idea of the non-local mind or the mind outside the brain, because I don't think the mind is just kind of free-floating nowhere in particular. I think our minds are normally rooted in our brains, just as they seem to be, uh, but they extend much beyond them, which is why uh, attention and intention can have effects at a distance. Now, I know you've done a whole lot of work with plants that was uh, in your early career. Do you think plants have a consciousness and trees have a type of consciousness? I know there's been some alternative studies in that area. Well, I think they have, um, I think they have morphic fields that organize their form. What plants mainly do is grow, and the shape they grow in depends on a, a, a form-shaping field, which is called a morphogenetic field. It's an to do with morphogenesis, the development of form. It's one kind of morphic field, which are these shaping fields that I think shape everything in nature and contain a kind of memory. So I think plants do have a kind of memory. I do think they have a kind of rather mind-like field. But I don't doubt if they're conscious in the same sense we're conscious. Um, you know, we're, our own consciousness is shaped by language. And as animals, we have the ability to move around. and all animals have brains that control their muscular systems. Well, plants don't do that. But what they do is have an awareness of gravity and light, and th which are the main things that concern them. And, uh, and they grow uh, towards the light or away from the light in the case of roots. Um, so I think their minds, insofar as they have minds, are primarily concerned with things like gravity, light, and growth and form. Um, and would be very hard for us to recognize as minds if we were able to get inside a plant. But they do communicate with our minds, and um, there's a sense in which plants communicate with animals all the time, and flowers, after all, and fruits are a kind of communication. There'd be no point in a plant forming a flower if there was an, it wasn't an animal to see it, unless it's a wind-pollinated flower. But most of the colored flowers and the scented flowers that we have in our gardens um, are there because plants have evolved them in a kind of communication or dialogue with animals. Wow. And, I mean, Darwin, in one of his rare poetic moments, Darwin said, there could have been no flower until there was an eye to see it. And True. So, you see, there, that's an interaction, and fruits are an interaction, too. Plants produce fruits that smell good, taste good, look good, uh, precisely because they attract animals. If it wasn't for animals, they wouldn't bother producing fruits. Um, and they also, of course, produce chemicals which um, give flavor to things like mint and, uh, you know, all the herbs and spices. And, of course, they also produce psychoactive chemicals, as in the case of cannabis, ayahuasca, and so forth, the, the, the plants that make up ayahuasca. Well, why they do that, who knows? These are things which have powerful effects on animals, including humans. Um, and these are another form of communication between plants and animals. So I think there's a, a whole lot of dialogues going on between plants and animals, but they're usually taking place through, you know, 
smells, colors, chemicals, yeah. tastes, and so on. That's really interesting. I never thought about about flowers and uh, and fruits as a type of communication, but it just it's just about changing your definition of communication, really. It, uh, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. But to segue into another topic, uh, let me say I became familiar with your work due to the crossovers and conversations you'd had with Terrence McKenna, who I've always considered one of my favorite minds. And as Graham Hancock, whose TED Talk also faced the same banning controversy as yours, I sometimes wonder if it's the experiences with psychedelics that fertilize the minds of some great scholars to entertain the less conventional theories and study fringe subject material. Do you think that has anything to do with it? I think it could have. Um, Yes. I wouldn't like to say it always does because there are a lot of people who are just naturally creative and who don't seem to need any chemical aids. Um, True. um, And there are some people who take psychedelics who are completely conventional in their outer life. You know, there there are quite a number of scientists who, um, to all intents and purposes, when you visit them in the lab, you know, just look like regular guys. But um, behind the scenes, they're interested in psychedelics. They have psychic experiences. Science is full of closet um, psychedelic takers and, and people with psychic powers and spiritual interests. It's just that within the culture of science, most people don't feel free to talk about it to their colleagues. But, you know, in a sense, I'm out of the closet. So a lot lot of scientists talk to me about their experiences um, in private. Um, But most of their colleagues wouldn't have the faintest idea that they have deviant views because in in public they they try to pretend to be completely conventional and straight. Mm -hmm. That's a common feature of science, and it's a great shame, actually, because... um, uh, most scientists aren't as boring as the official view of science makes science look. and um, But they're very afraid of, of coming out of the closet or making their colleagues think they're at all weird in their interests because they're afraid they'll lose their grants or their jobs or their reputation or something like that. And I think that science will change dramatically when scientists feel free to come out of the closet and talk to their colleagues at work. Um, about the things that really interest them. Yeah, I guess uh, with psychedelics, it's kind of a chicken or an egg kind of thing. It's you, well, usually it's probably the uh, inquisitive mind would entertain psychedelics already rather, rather than the rigid mind who would dismiss them as uh, you know, party favors. Yes. Um, but, you know, I mentioned your, your TED Talk, and this is kind of what we're talking about, um, the material in Science Set Free the dogma of, of science to not look at the stranger aspects of life. You've been working on this. It seems like Graham Hancock's doing the same similar thing, talking about the dogma of history and the dogma of uh, looking back at some of the structures we have and reexamining the timeline of humanity. Uh, Terence kind of did this in the dogma of the social structure, trying to challenge that. Um, I feel like you guys are all doing similar things to challenge the paradigm in just different areas and I love it. That's one of my favorite things. I feel like that's what brings new ideas to my mind and uh, without it, I mean what are we really learning? Well, I agree Um, and again, I think there are many people who actually are interested in these things even though you never guess it from their public persona. Uh, There's a lot going on behind the scenes Um, I think the interesting thing about the TED controversy was that TED took down my talk and Graham Hancock's from the TEDx site in response to protests by very reactionary figures, the P.Z. Myers and and Jerry Coyne, the the militant atheist bloggers. Um, I think they behaved hastily, and I think they've come to regret it. I had a talk with Chris Anderson, who runs TED, on the telephone during that crisis, and we spoke for half an hour or so, and he was very friendly. And I got the impression he rather regretted that they'd taken this decision. Once they'd taken it, they had to stick with it. (laughs) Um, But a journalist who is writing um, a book about this um, whole TED episode uh, told me last week that he'd interviewed Chris Anderson recently, and Chris Anderson said as a result of all this controversy over my book, Science Set Free, he actually bought a copy and has read it. And um, 
uh, and apparently really enjoyed it and, and found it gave him a whole new way of looking at things. So um, I don't think Anderson himself is necessarily stuck into this old mindset. Some of the people around him are, and he's under pressure from some of these very reactionary forces um, in the scientific world. Um, I think he, he has the potential to be considerably more open, as a matter of fact. I hope that that will be reflected in the future direction of TED and TED <laughs> Talks. So it might all have done some good in the end. Right. Um, it certainly was helpful in spreading ideas, this controversy, but I think it might also have done something to to lighten up TED itself. Yeah, um, I, I think they d it definitely had the reverse effect. I mean, if they would have just left it alone, it would have been amongst all these TED Talks, there would have been nothing... Uh, anomalous about it but by by drawing all this attention specifically to you and graham hancock by censoring your talks i mean they're now what everybody talks about as far as ted talks are concerned i think the biggest conversation going around is this bit of censorship and then everybody goes online to watch these two specific talks over other ones it yeah i know has... it's uh, before they banned my talk it had had thirty five thousand views and it's now had at least five hundred thousand <laughs> so uh, i mean it's certainly um being completely counterproductive from their point of view. Funny how it works out. Um, the universe works in mysterious ways. But yes. <laughs> there is a lot of good material in that talk. And, I w and if we had more time, I'd love to discuss the details and examples of it. But a side note that I found interesting was that you made the presentation barefoot. What was the motivation behind that? I don't know. Um, the organizers of this event had created a kind of mossy platform on the stage. <laughs> and they asked all the presenters to do it barefoot. So it wasn't me uh, being eccentric or with some peculiar idiosyncrasy. I was just following the house rules. Oh, that's and so funny. I'd never been in a TED event before. For all I knew, all TED talks were barefoot. So I, you know, I just did it because they said, this is, what, this is the way we're doing it. Would you mind taking your shoes off and standing on this moss? So I said, no, that's fine. <laughs> but when the TED Talk was screened on stage, quite a few people thought that I, I had some kind of peculiar thing about being barefoot. Well, I like being barefoot, and it's nice standing on moss and stuff, but um, I, I can't claim that it was my own idea. <laughs> well, the reason I even bring it up is because there are a lot of people who talk about energy and electrical charges, and they utilize products like grounding mats, and they recommend walking barefoot on grass to discharge the static buildup of the body. And I'm not sure... I mean, what I think about that, I've never, I don't know. But do you think there's any validity to those kind of things? Well, I certainly think it feels more natural walking barefoot. And, uh, you know, there have been periods in my life when I have done it, when I lived in India, in a village in South India. I, I was barefoot quite a lot of the time. And, but, of course, you have to harden up your feet. I mean, if I do it now, I, it would just be quite painful in those circumstances. Um yeah, I think, I, I mean, I've no idea whether one absorbs Earth energies, but it certainly feels more natural to do that, and it does give a greater sense of connection. Interesting. Well, I know you need to get going. It's been great to be able to bounce some of my weirdo questions off of someone that I admire. Uh, the reality that the scientific community is dogmatic and stuck within an established rigid paradigm is definitely not new to the listeners of this show. It's actually... Uh, probably the fact that contributes to the success of the show because people are hungry to hear about things that conventionalists won't touch. And uh, because the establishment isn't doing it, they got to look somewhere else. But you know, your latest work is doing a great job in breaking it down and hopefully turning a lot of young scientific minds, which is crucial, and I applaud that path. But is there anything else you're working on or any other information you'd like to leave the people with, maybe your website? Oh, yes, definitely take a look at my website, sheldrake.org. And I have an online, um, or at least a cell phone telepathy test and other tests online at the online experiments portal. So any who wants, anyone who wants to try out an experiment for themselves, you know, do have a go. Awesome. That is very cool. Um, well, Rupert, good sir. I'm just thankful I was able to form full sentences in your presence. Uh, thanks for being here. I appreciate your time, and I know that people do too. Take care and keep fighting the good fight. Guys, my pleasure. All the best. Bye. All right, bye. There we go, people. A little shorter than most episodes of THC, but I'm a big fan of Rupert Sheldrake, and I'm happy to have talked to him for any amount of time. 
Please share the show with your people if you found it interesting and review us on iTunes. That's always a huge help. And you can support and sustain my life with the purchase of one of many t-shirts offered at conspiratees.net. I got two new designs coming very soon. Anyway, you guys are great. Thanks for the support. The show is growing like a pesticide-resistant strain of good old-fashioned Monsanto corn, and that's fast. And we'll be back next week with Jeff Berwick, the dollar vigilante, to learn how to internationalize ourselves to avoid going down with the ship we call the USS economy. I suspect we might learn something. In the meantime, take care of yourself, enjoy some good vices, and walk barefoot. And we'll talk about that DMT experience soon. Peace.